This morning we are looking at again a, a couple of more stories as Matthew records them in his gospel in chapter 9. If you would stand with me, I want to read verses 18 through 26. Matthew 9, starting with verse 18. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, Go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all the region. You may be seated. Allison is just one of many stories demonstrating the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, reminding us of regardless of the fire that we find ourselves in, we are never alone in that fire. What we've been learning over the past several weeks is that the Father's heart is always toward the one, toward the one in that fire, toward the one in that situation, the one sheep, the one coin, the one son, the one daughter with multiple myeloma, the one he's looking for, the one who needs him, the one who is searching for him, the one who is lost and lonely, looking for the one who thinks that they're the only one going through what they're going through, whatever that is, facing impossible odds or insurmountable obstacles. Last week, we looked at the story of an unlikely candidate, an Ethiopian eunuch in a deserted place, feeling rejected and unworthy, receiving the gospel, the good news that you are never alone. Friends, this is what the Beyond Initiative is all about, connecting with people who wouldn't normally connect with us with a message that it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what you've done or what's been done to you, that you are never unworthy or unwanted, that you are never beyond hope or healing. And so we posed this question last week, if the church and the community no longer existed, would the community notice, and more so, would it miss us, right? I mean, when it comes to the community at large, People who don't go to church, who give no thought to church, who maybe even be resistant to church. If we no longer existed in this community, would this community notice that we were gone? And more importantly, would they miss us if we were not, if we were no longer here? For the past 32 years, we have existed to help people connect to God, his church, and his world. This is all about following Jesus and helping others do the same. We would call that discipleship, rooted in the great commandment and the great commission the great commandment, preaching the gospel, the good news that you are never alone, that you are never without hope and healing, and the great commandment that you are loved, that you are cared for. Jesus demonstrated this with his own life. The most important person in Jesus' life was the one in his life in that moment. He was always focusing on the one, the one standing before him, the one calling out his name, the one seeking his help, the one asking him questions. Jesus was always on mission. And he only had three years to complete it. But at every turn, at every turn, it seemed like that while he was focused going in one direction, he got diverted and going to another direction. While he was focused on one person, he got distracted by another person. In fact, the Gospel of Mark actually records Jesus being interrupted 35 times. And those are just the times that we know about. That while he was doing this or going there or talking to this one person, he was interrupted 35 times, have you ever been interrupted? <clears throat> Trying to have an adult conversation with a four-year-old, tugging your legs, seeking your attention? Trying to teach them manners? Working on a project, knowing that you need to get it done and how you need to get it done, only by, to be asked by someone who loves you and you love them, asking you to help them get something done. Have you ever not answered the phone because you didn't want to be disturbed or distracted or disengaged in what you were focused on? Have you ever been interrupted? Have you ever been pulled away from what you wanted to do, what you needed to do because someone wanted something else from you? Friends, this was the life of Jesus. With the only difference that he wasn't bothered by it. 
right? I mean, his, his agenda was never so pressing that he couldn't be interrupted. Jesus was doing one thing, one, going one place, talking to one person, and someone would step in with a scenario that changed the course of the story. Jesus is preaching in a synagogue, and a leper who shouldn't even be there interrupts the sermon because he needs healing. Jesus is teaching in a home, and that home is so crowded, listening intently to what Jesus has to say. When the, t- the, when the roof tiles start to cave in because this group of guys is lowering down one of their friends. Why? Because he needs healing. His frightened disciples wake him up in the middle of the night while he's sleeping soundly because they need the storm to die down. A woman of ill repute interrupts a dinner party. Another woman with an alabaster jar interrupts a private gathering. And this passage before us in in Matthew 9 records three particular interruptions that, again, diverted the attention of Jesus to a particular need. And we'll get to those in a moment. But I just want to press this point because we're supposed to be Jesus followers, right? We are supposed to be Jesus followers. What is a Jesus follower? Friends, isn't a Jesus follower one that would go where Jesus goes and do what Jesus would do and say what Jesus would say, respond and react the way Jesus would in any situation? I have to admit, I don't want to do this. I thought maybe I should take this out of the message. But I'm just gonna, Here it is. The, this thing right here that I'm going to talk about today is probably one of, it may be my greatest pet peeve of life, I, I hate to be interrupted, which is to say, and I don't, evidently, I consider my life to be so important and my agenda so critical that to have someone step in and to mess up my schedule is the height of disrespect. I mean, any any interruption is an irritation, and every interrupter is an annoyance. Why? Because I, do I have any honest takers here? Okay, you're all liars. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I have an itinerary mapped for the day, and God have mercy on the person who would disrupt my schedule. So before we go any further in this uh, this talk, I just, if I could put the whole sermon in one sentence, it would be this on the screen. Look at it. If we're going to love people the way Jesus loved people, we're Jesus followers, right? We have to see people the way Jesus sees people. Let me say that again. If we're going to love people the way Jesus loved people, we have to see people the way Jesus sees people. Who's your one? Who's your one? Let me suggest to you this morning that one of the greatest challenges you will face in building a bridge to the one God has placed in your life will not be the theological discussions you're afraid to get into. They will not be the questions that your one will ask you that you're afraid you will not be able to answer. That will not be your challenge. It will not be the moral or ethical lifestyle choices that your one might be making, and you don't know how to address that. Should you speak into that? What do you do about those kinds of things? That won't be your challenge. It will not be the personality and temperament differences between the two of you, because the reason you picked your one is because you already like your one, so that's not going to be it. The greatest challenge in this who's your one mission in your life is going to be making room in your life for them in a life that is already full of your own agenda. Pastor Tim, you want me to be intentional? You want me to be deliberate and proactive about building a bridge to someone who needs Jesus? Where am I going to find the time for that? And for some of you, be honest, where are you going to find the emotional space for that? Where are you going to find the reserves to deal with this kind of challenge? Where in your current relational network are you going to fit another human being with a story into your story? That's the challenge. As much as you might love them, care for them, concern for their eternal destiny, the challenge is where am I going to find time for one more? So before we get into Matthew 9, I just want to share two thoughts to set us up. Number one, Jesus was on mission. He had a mission and three short years to complete it. He was always on the move and constantly interrupted and remarkably present to every person in his path. And so it might be good to remind all of us that what Jesus had to do on this earth is infinitely more important than what you and I have to do on this earth, right? Agreed? 
And yet Jesus never saw people who interrupted his agenda as interruptions because they were his agenda. The most important person to Jesus was the person he was with in that moment, and people felt that about him. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. Why? Because Jesus liked them. And they knew that. And that's a pretty good question for all of us to ask about ourselves, right? Do people who are nothing like us like us because we like them? And do they know that? I mean, it's just natural for people of any sort and any, to gravitate toward people who are, are alike. I mean, we just lean toward affinity. That is human nature. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but it does limit our effectiveness with the gospel. We like people who like us and who are like us. And so we have to fight this constantly to get out of our own comfort zones and to be intentional with our relationships. Friends, the longer you are a Christian, the greater the tendency for you to develop spiritual amnesia, to forget what it was like not to be saved. I mean, that was a constant criticism of Jesus, right? Hanging around those who were not saved. He was constantly hanging out with the wrong crowd. He was eating with the wrong people. He was going to the wrong parties, drinking really good wine, I would assume, but, uh, but still, I mean, and he responded to that criticism. We find it in Luke 5. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Friends, people were his agenda, so no one was an interruption. And then the second thought I want to share is that remember that guy who asked the question, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Remember that? Brings us back to the great commandment, loving our neighbor as ourselves. This lawyer wants to justify his own morality, claiming that he's kept all the commandments. But just to make sure, let's clarify, Jesus, who's my one? Basically, he's asking, who is this one? Who is my neighbor? In the attempt to justify his own goodness, this man needed to narrow the parameters of goodness in order to maintain his own sense of goodness, to which Jesus tells this story. We're all familiar with the Good Samaritan. A man is robbed and left for dead. A Jewish priest happens by but does nothing. A Levite comes along, does nothing. Both men, socially respected for their goodness, neither of them do good. A Samaritan comes along, and Jesus intentionally makes the hero a Samaritan to expose this lawyer's prejudice, someone who is not like him, and makes this one point. When you cross paths with someone in need, guess what? You have a neighbor. But that wasn't the question that Jesus poses. He wasn't answering the question, who's my neighbor? He's answering the question, will you be a neighbor? That was the question to this lawyer, will you be the neighbor that this neighbor needs? The compelling thing about this whole story is that Jesus doesn't explain to the lawyer what a neighbor is. He just talks about what a neighbor does. A neighbor sees a need and meets that need, even to, at great cost to themselves. So this good Samaritan who saw someone who was not like him, but loved him at great cost to himself. I mean, he put his agenda aside. He adjusted his own life and schedule, rearranged his priorities, sacrificed his own personal convenience and personal resources, and made an investment to change a life. Who's your one? And at what cost, what inconvenience, what interruption are you willing to afford to influence their next step? toward Jesus. Now, here's the deal, friends. When Jesus posed the question, who was, or answered the question, who was the neighbor? The answer was Jesus himself, friends. We are the ones on the side of the road, beaten up by the brokenness of the world and the fruit of our own sin. It's Jesus who comes alongside and binds our wounds and saves us from death at great cost to himself. And he just calls us to do the same. We're Jesus followers, right? And so what's the point, friends? The point is that there's nothing more important to Jesus than people. And any neighbor worth his salt is willing to be interrupted or inconvenienced at great cost to himself to love his neighbor well. So let's get into this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. While he was saying this, while... While he was saying this, so the, saying what? Saying what? Now, we don't have it on the screen. If you have your Bible in front of you, you would see that the, immediately prior, the, the context of this encounter of Jesus with this man, 
uh, is Jesus having a conversation with the disciples of John the Baptist over the issue of fasting. Right before this section, Matthew records the, the disciples of John meeting up with Jesus and his disciples and wanting to know why Jesus' disciples don't fast. Why don't they fast? And Jesus is trying to explain uh, this issue with the disciples of John. So Jesus is in, this, in the middle of all this when a man by the name of Jairus, and we know this by gospel, uh, Mark's gospel in chapter 5, verse 22, then one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, comes desperately seeking Jesus. So Jairus, this synagogue ruler, which means he would have been known in the community. He would have been well-respected. When Jairus showed up, people would have paid attention. He's probably well-to-do or at least above average financially. But he has a daughter who has just died. So imagine the heartbreak, the desperation. Imagine the insistence in this man's voice, the intensity of his request. Imagine, as well you can, If this was you and Jesus was in the middle of a Bible question with a bunch of Sunday school teachers, how motivated would you to be just to stand back and wait for that conversation to conclude? No, you wouldn't do that. Sense the urgency, but friends, don't miss the irony as well. For Jairus was a synagogue ruler, which meant he was probably a a scribe more than likely a Pharisee. And if you know anything about the gospel context, the historical context, in those, there, was, there was a social dynamic to this interruption. Doubtful that Jairus and Jesus were Facebook friends. I mean, Jesus wasn't exactly in with a religious crowd in that day. Synagogue rulers were far more interested in trapping Jesus than fellowshipping with Jesus, seeking his assistance. But Jairus couldn't deny the reports. He had heard about Jesus. He knew what Jesus was capable of doing. And friends, when you're desperate, you're apt to compromise anything in your standard. It doesn't matter what Jairus thinks of Jesus personally. He's out of options. And so he comes to Jesus. And here's the thing. It didn't matter to Jesus either. Whatever Jairus had thought of him before, whatever criticism or prejudice Jairus may have held against Jesus, Jesus didn't hold that against Jairus. Jairus was now in his path, and people are his agenda. And so he's going to be the neighbor that this neighbor needs. However, on the way to Jairus' house, interruption number three occurs. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. 12 years, notice that. Now, we don't have the exact di- diagnosis, but what we do know that According to Jewish culture, in those days, any physical malady involving blood would classify you as an unclean person, and so you were ostracized and isolated from society. Anything you touched would become tainted as well. So for 12 years, this woman was not only sick, she was excluded from community, left alone to suffer. She was an outcast. You're unclean, and anyone who touches you is unclean. Anyone you touch is unclean, and so you can understand why she does what she does. Uh, Verse 21, she says, if I can only touch his cloak. So she worms her way through the crowd, thinking if I can just touch his cloak, I will be healed. And again, this is the context. Jesus is in the middle of a mission. He's on his way to a crisis, and he gets sidetracked by yet another need. This woman shows up. She is now in his path with a need, and people are his agenda. And so he's going to be the neighbor that this neighbor needs. He stops, and he turns, and responds. Verse 22, he saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now, understand, she had no business being there. She knew it. She knew what the rules were. Anybody who knew her knew she was not permitted to be there. She was infecting the whole crowd being there. But Jesus was her only hope. And now, get this, she's, she's not just interrupting Jesus, right? I mean, she's interrupting Jairus. And did I mention that he's a synagogue ruler? I mean, he's kind of important. And his request, we all know, is pretty serious. But she's heard the same reports. And she has her own story. She experiences her own desperation. These two people could not have been more different. Jairus was wealthy. This woman was poor. Jairus had a name. This woman is unknown. Jairus was respected. This woman was a social outcast. Jairus' daughter, we know from Mark's gospel, was 12 years old when she died. 
This woman was, has been sick for 12 years. Jairus was bold enough to step in and interrupt and ask for what he wanted. This woman was too afraid to expose herself publicly. Their lives could not have been more different, and yet their stories had one thing in common. They needed Jesus. Friends, our stories may be different, but the need is the same, and the solution is the same. And while our stories may take us down different paths, the destination, our only hope, is the same. Friends, everybody's story is the same. The song is the same. The verse may be different. The chorus is the same. I once was blind, but now I... Friends, if the whole sermon could be put in one sentence, it would be this. If we are going to love people the way Jesus loved people, we have to see people the way Jesus sees people. John 3.16, most of you know it, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. It's tempting for us to reduce the mission of Jesus to saving the world. Saving the world is a pretty big job. I know Jesus is up to it. The world is a pretty big place. Jesus is up to it. This is a really, but this is a really good place for people to get lost in the crowd, to get lost in the world, to become a number of the 8 billion people in the world. You need to know, friends, that Jesus doesn't see the world. He sees you. He sees you. And you have a name. You are a daughter. You are a son. And you are not an interruption. And what's true of you is true of everyone. Friends, you have never locked eyes with another human being that does not matter to God. Therefore, they should matter to us. And to quote Mr. Rogers, will you be a neighbor? Doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, what they're dealing with, what they've been through. Friends, their answer, their only hope is the same for all, and his name is Jesus. So going back to the Beyond Initiative and posing this question, who's your one? Friends, here's the reality. The park on 8th, the park on 8th is not going to benefit everyone, but it is going to benefit someone. It is going to benefit one child. It is going to benefit one family. It is going to benefit one group. It is going to create opportunities to connect with people who wouldn't normally connect with us. It is our way of saying what matters to you matters to us. And we are going to build that bridge and be your neighbor because everyone matters. Who's your one? Can I pray for you? Father, we thank you that you did not consider us an interruption that you do not see the world, you see us. And you know our name, and you know our story, and you are the answer to our need. And may that gospel, may that good news so move us that we would in turn build bridges to those who need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.